Welcome to Stories After Midnight. Today we'll be reading a story called Museum of Alien Life, Part 1. It's from a collection of stories by Tobias Wade called 54 Sleepless Nights. I'd love it if you really like this story and you've heard the other ones. If you pick yourself up a copy and just, you know, support the author if you want to. No pressure. But if you do, please let me know so I can say thank you on behalf of him. So, I hope you enjoy this story. Let's get started. I was never one of those kids into superheroes or fantasy. Magic spells, undead creatures, monsters from the deep. What a waste of time. By the time you learn the truth about Santa, you're old enough to understand that reality is more mysterious and wonderful for being true than any make-believe story can ever be. Instead of believing the impossible, I believe the probable. Aliens aren't a story of some forgotten past that no one will ever be able to prove. They're part of our inevitable future. Earth has been beaming out radio waves for over a hundred years, and our signal is only getting stronger as technology advances. Space is too big for something not to be listening, and it's only ever been a matter of time before something responds to our call. It's not a matter of waiting. Aliens have already been here for ages, my high school friend Nola told me after class one day. It was a new school for me after I'd had trouble at the last one. Different story. And Nola was about the only other person who'd talked to me here. He had long shaggy brown hair that was constantly in his eyes, and a really dry sense of humor that never showed up on his blank features. It was almost impossible to tell when he was joking or not, and I remember thinking he was making fun of me at first. You believe in that stuff? I asked, cautious to not make a fool of myself. Nah, don't believe. Believing means taking something on faith, but there's plenty of evidence for alien visits. Haven't you ever been to the Museum of Alien Life? So what? They have Bigfoot museums too. I countered. Bunch of blurry photographs and unreliable stories from drunk farmers. No thank you. Nope. This place is the real deal, Nola insisted. Guy who runs it used to be in government. He got his hands on all sorts of stuff that wasn't supposed to get out. Like the government would just let him walk out the door with that stuff. Don't be an idiot. The government couldn't do anything to him without making it look like he's onto something. Besides, he's got other things hidden away outside the museum, and they'd get released if anything happened to him, so the government just ignores him and hope people think he's crazy. But he's not. You in or not? Nah? I don't know why I allowed myself to get my hopes up. The museum looked exactly like I thought it would, with a tacky little gift shop in the front filled with stuffed green alien toys, ectoplasmic goo, and decorative stickers and mugs. Nola had this little smirk like he just pulled one over on me, but I grabbed a green inflatable Martian man and held it up like I just found the Holy Grail. Oh my gosh, this is unbelievable, I said in shocked awe. A real life alien, and it's exactly how I thought it would look. Hope you brought the rope, I think this one's a fighter. I beat Nola over the head with the inflatable alien, but he barely reacted. The little smirk on his face slowly faded as he stared over my shoulder. I turned to see a man in his 40s wearing a shaggy beard and camouflage. He wore a ragged baseball cap that said Semper Fi in gold letters. He pulled back sharply as I turned, and I got the unnerving feeling that he had just been sniffing the back of my head. You gonna buy that? The man asked in a disinterested tone. No sir, Mr. Ackles. We're here for the hunting lesson, Nola said without hesitation. I thought Nola was just making fun of his camouflage, so I started snickering but I stopped when neither of the others reacted. Mr. Ackles took off his hat and scratched his head, scowling. His hair was buzzed short enough to reveal the horrendous scars around the top of his head, like someone had once tried to take the top off with a chainsaw. You want to be an alien hunter, son? Mr. Ackles asked me seriously. That's how you get to see the good stuff, Nola whispered in my ear. Absolutely, I answered loudly. I almost caught a squirrel once and figure I'm ready for aliens now. Nola elbowed me in the ribs, but I maintained a straight face while the man in camouflage studied me. I caught his nose twitching and quivering again, but he swiftly turned away from us and opened a metal door in the back of the room. It was completely dark inside, except for black lights that made the place look like a cross between a retro arcade and a spaceship. Go on then. Have a look around. I'll join you as soon as the others get here. I followed Nola into the back room glancing back to see the museum owner moving to the front window and putting up a closed sign behind the glass. In retrospect, I should have been more concerned by that, but the dark room was so enticing and Nola seemed to know what he was doing. 
and I let my excitement get the better of me. You ever seen anything like this in your life? Nola asked earnestly, as he pressed up against a glass cabinet. This stuff came straight from a spaceship. Honestly, it was a long way from the rusted debris I expected. Long shards of white, almost crystalline metal lined the interior shelves. They glowed faintly with their own soft luminescence that didn't seem to be coming from the black lights inside the case. Farther down, something like a spacesuit was on display for a creature that must have had dozens of arms running down each side of its body. There was also a cracked screen that streamed unfamiliar lettering down in an endless display. Two big round cylinders, which could have been part of an engine, and cases and cases full of strange hooked and curved tools. They were all built from the same strange crystalline metal, and if I looked closely enough, the material seemed to be in a constant fluid state as it sluggishly circulated around the objects. Living metal. I jumped at the voice so close behind my shoulder. Mr. Ackles had entered quietly along with three other people. They were difficult to distinguish in the dark room, but one woman wore a white shirt which glowed beneath the black light. The other two wore dark clothing, a large man who seemed like a bodybuilder who let himself go, and a lanky fellow wearing a suit with a glowing tie. You're looking at the salvage from Persia 8, a vessel which touched down in the Utah desert in 2015, Mr. Ackles said, the words rattling off like a practiced monologue. Only the booster section of the craft that helped them descend into the atmosphere was recovered, however. The aliens themselves, naturally, would have detached before landing with a more portable vehicle designed for terrestrial travel. Why would they leave their spacesuit behind? The lanky man asked, maneuvering past me to inspect the artifact. I caught a heavy wave of cologne as he passed, potent enough to cover up the smell of a corpse. Not usual for Persia-type encounters, Mr. Ackles replied sagely. The evidence suggests these creatures visit Earth on a one-way ticket. You don't discard your booster engines and space equipment unless you plan on staying here. The woman giggled faintly, prompting Mr. Ackles to pivot on his heel and stick his face a few inches from hers. Did I say something that amused you, Jesse? No, sir, she replied immediately. There's nothing funny about alien invaders. Spoken like a true hunter, Mr. Ackles said, his toothy smile glowing in the black light. Meanwhile, Nola and I had apparently reached the end of the display cases. They were cool to be sure, but nothing I'd call definitive proof yet. I was trying to get Nola's attention to see what to expect next, but he was transfixed staring into the cracked screen with its strange lettering. His brow was furrowed in concentration, like he was trying to read the script. Now, your most important tool that all alien hunters need to get acquainted with is the gamma detector, Mr. Ackles said. I turned to watch him producing an electronic device that looked a bit like a large forehead thermometer, large enough that he had to use both hands to support it. Your typical aliens will have spent months or years in a spacecraft before coming to Earth, Mr. Ackles continued. We rely on our atmosphere filtering out most of the dangerous gamma rays from stars, but that type of long interstellar transit will leave detectable traces on an organic system. Mind you, this won't work on aliens that were born here, or your inorganic robotic type that... The machine in his hand began to beep rapidly as his voice trailed off. How do you read it? The large man asked, leaning down to peer at the device. Nola abruptly grabbed my arm, whispering in my ear. We should get out of here. That's odd. It doesn't usually... Mr. Ackles turned the device over in his hand, shaking it. Nola began dragging me insistently toward the door, but I was distracted by the gamma device and wasn't cooperating. But then he gave up and made a dash back the way we came. Roger, bar the door, Mr. Ackles snapped urgently. The large man shifted into place immediately, blocking the museum entrance. You aren't seriously saying one of us, Jesse stammered. The device is functioning properly, Mr. Ackles gloated with undisguised glee. I've scanned this room a hundred times. There's no reading from these inorganic devices. What a perfect demonstration of alien hunting to root out one of our own. I really don't care about being an alien hunter enough to spend all day here, Nola protested, making another move for the door. No one leaves, Mr. Ackles snarled, waving the device viciously through the air. It would have slammed into Nola if he hadn't scrambled back just in time. Not until we learn who has been lying to us. Not until the imposter is revealed. That's the end of the story. Part one, if you will, of two parts, so there will be more. 
I really hope you enjoyed it, and I hope to see you in the next one. If you did and you're on YouTube, I mean if you did like the story, I'd appreciate it if you'd like the video, or leave a comment letting me know your thoughts and subscribe for part 2 perchance? If you'd like to, you can come join our Discord and hang out with us where we just, you know, chill. But other than that, there's not a whole lot going on. If you'd like to support the channel more, uh, other than liking and subscribing or sharing or whatever, there is a Patreon you can come join, and I would be oh so grateful if you did. But that's not required. It just helps the channel grow and continue on. So I appreciate you nonetheless for listening on the podcast or on YouTube. I hope you enjoyed yourself. We'll see you in the next video for part two.